Welcome, everyone. Thank you so much for joining today. I'm Deborah Eckerling, author of your goal guide and creator of the Deb Method for Goal Setting Simplified. And you can't reach your goals on your own. You need your people. So every week I bring together some of my people to dive into the topic of the week. And well, I love all my topics and I all my guests are awesome. But this one in particular, we're talking about creating content, which anybody who knows me, there's always something. And it doesn't matter what your business you got to put yourself out there. And what does that mean? Putting your words, your voice, your image, and whatever. So I've got this wonderful panel today. We have Rob Kuttner, who, among other things, is the author of Snot Goblins and Other Tasteless Tales. And Julie Riley from StreamYard, who is, what we say, social media community and affiliate manager, but really like grand poobah of all that is StreamYard Outreach. And I love, so she's the video aspect, Rob's the written word, and we're all like a little bit of everything. So I'm very excited for this. And if you're watching live, great. You may even be watching the replay of this as the Dev Show podcast on the Marketing Podcast Network. Either way, we are glad you're here and wanting to up those content goals. And before we really dive into the topic, uh, guests, please introduce yourself and also share what it is about this topic that that really gets you excited. So Rob, let's start with you. Um, yeah, so I'm a uh, former late night writer. Uh, I wrote for Conan and The Daily Show, and I've been working in animation and books for the uh, past uh, five years. And um, should I talk about the new book yet, or you'll tell me when to? <laughs> oh, you can talk about the new book. Oh, I have a brand new. Want. I have a brand new um, uh, kids book called Snot Goblins and Other Tasteless Tales, which is a highly sophisticated and illiterate uh, collection of horror tales for kids with a strong dose of humor and an even stronger dose of disgust uh, for kids who like the sort of Captain Underpants Dogman uh, style of humor. And even for kids who don't like to, quote unquote, don't like to read it, it's a graphic novel full of great gooey pictures. So a gateway drug into reading, if you will. <laughs> and so I recently interviewed Rob for the Jewish Journal, but we actually met, I was trying to figure it out. What was it like 15 years ago? And so prime so. time. Yeah. It's and, been so long. I know. I know. I don't want to make yourself yeah. feeling older, so <laughs> it'll take 15. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's a good number. Well, and that's really one of the things that's so great about, I mean, there's a lot bad I guess people can argue about social media, but one of the really good things is you can stay in touch with people, even though you don't see or talk to them, you really feel in touch. And I think you're like, such a great example of that. So I'm really excited to have you on to dive into to the topic and to bring that writerly perspective um, because you do so many different types of things in the writing world. So gonna be fun. Julie, welcome back Hi. to chat live great to see you you too i'm excited to be back so please share who you are and why you are here yeah. So I'm Julie Riley. I am the social media manager at StreamYard. But like Deb said, I also do community management, affiliate management. I have been in the social media uh, industry. Ooh, we're going on about 15 years now. I'm dating myself there a little. Like started at the very, very early days of really getting into doing social media as a business. Um, so it's kind of been really fun journey, learning all of the changes. Uh, you know, as we know, it's changing constantly. Uh, and I'm here because content creation is definitely something I, as a social media manager, you can't be one without creating content. It, and so I, I shared my Rob backstory. So we've been friends since I worked for social media examiner and I haven't worked for them since 2018. But again, like that, we, we met in San Diego for social media marketing world and managed to stay in touch. And we were talking before we really only catch up when you're on my show. So we're going to have to, to do a little bit of, of catch up time, but you can, it's not just all, hi, how are you? But by creating content is really one of the best ways to stay in touch with people and then for longer projects or bigger bigger deals like what rob does that that i think goes back into the core behind what you create and or as a business so i think i've managed to over explain this really really well <laughs> um but so rob you you basically if someone said hey rob write something you would just do it because that's 
no, your background so multifaceted. I'm, I'm on strike, so I'd say no. But <laughs> I will rephrase the question. So, Rob, you write a lot of different things. Can you give us a nice little overview about your writer journey? Yeah, so some things I can talk about that are not affected by the the, the TV writer strike is um, uh, I've tried to create things in a lot of different media. So um, uh, I, I uh, back in the early days of podcasting also as well, I, I created a, a scripted comedy series for what was called Howl FM, which was an aggregator of Comedy Bang Bang and WTF and some of the big um and it didn't i think it didn't make it because there was a paywall involved and people were used to free podcasts and various things like that but um so i created a scripted sort of almost an old school radio play audio series with weird al yankovic and ken jennings jeopardy champion um and then i uh i i uh, published an adult graphic novel a few years ago with the comic book startup um which also didn't make it so maybe i'm the black widow of <laughs> of comedy media um, and then I've written this book, and then I also um, wrote a book for the um, the, new, the 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 recent Ant Man uh, MCU movie, the Ant Man movie. Uh, Scott Lang, uh, Ant Man, Paul Rudd uh, reads his memoirs, and so they made a real book out of that. So I'm the ghostwriter for that, which is coming out in, uh, in a month, about a month actually. Um, so really, just a variety of other things, uh, a, variety, a variety of different things in different genres on top of late night, and then uh, more broadly, I'm sort of trying to get. Um, uh, some animated shows uh, made right now, which is a bit difficult with the sort of dysfunctional nature of Hollywood. Um, but those, those all different kinds of things are keeping me busy in different ways, at different times. Yeah, I, I think, and this is something I learned before I moved to LA, multiple projects at various stages of development. Yes, that's- that's. It's that's, basically it's, a line anyone can everyone, use. Everyone's that. first line at the bar, right? But you have to, you really have to, because like, you know, as you know, the marketplace is shifting all the time. And just even opportunities are like a merry-go-round. So you have to have a couple of things teed up. You have to have things in the air. And, you know, you spin one plate and you do another because you never know when someone's going to come back to you. So if you just try to focus on one thing, you could put all the effort in the world to it. And your partners or the audience you want or, you know, whoever are not ready for it, then you're just twiddling your thumbs. So I don't like to twiddle my thumbs. <laughs> <laughs> The thing that I find really interesting, so and and we'll let Julie go a little bit more deeper into the content she creates. It's pretty much the same thing with social media, is you need multiple things going on. And even this show, so we're it's Gold Chat Live, which is live streaming to LinkedIn, YouTube, and Facebook. And mm -hmm. then um, the replay will be available via blog post. We'll do a, a fun little uh, Instagram photo. Yep. Um, and then it magically becomes an episode of the Dev Show podcast and then gets released that way. So one piece of content, but put out there in different formats for people to consume it. Absolutely. And that's really the thing with social media is you aren't just making a post or you aren't just putting up pictures or just video. It's you really have to diversify that content um, because different people are going to consume different kinds of content. So if you're only putting out blog posts, you're going to lose everybody who doesn't want to sit and read a lengthy blog post. Or if you're only putting out podcasts, you're going to get lose the people who don't learn or don't um, consume content in an auditory fashion. So you have to really create all of those kinds of different pieces of content because you're going to have your auditory learners and your visual learners and your people who like the long form content and the people who like the short form content. It's why TikTok and Reels is doing so well because so many people want that short form consumable. But that didn't elim eliminate the blog and the podcast content either with that. So it's really kind of finding what's working with your audience, but making sure that you're providing multiple different forms to gather a larger audience. Can I respond to that? Because I totally, I totally resonate with that. Yeah, um, absolutely. I've been, I've been, I've been, re I've been uh, trying to take that challenge on with marketing this book because, you know, as you know, nowadays, unless you're sort of like Stephen King or John Grisham, <laughs> they, they don't really say, everyone says, oh, are you want a book tour? I'm like, <laughs> what's a book tour? Um, it's not really a thing anymore. And so right. you, it's sort of up to the artist, you know, to, to market themselves. And so I've been actually figuring that out a bunch of ways. So I created a bunch of short form videos, some were animated and some live action. And I sort of ran up against a wall around the, 
early because sort of my social media networks or my social media networks, you know, it's my family and friends. And then there's been all this stuff with Twitter. Twitter's gotten very like controversial, radioactive, and I really don't think there's been a clear successor. I'm on several other places and there's, there's very little engagement. And so I've been sort of finding creative new ways to, um, to uh, try to market this, which is like, you know, for example, when I do signings, I create, uh, I, I, I should have brought with me, but I have a little, it's not, I have a goblin monster that I have kids hold up. And so they take a picture with it and hope that they'll organically spread it. Um, I'm doing a live activity in Burbank uh, this weekend where we're doing kind of a scavenger hunt among several mm -hmm. local businesses um, for kids to find cards with characters from the book. And I'm hoping that without sort of like talking about that we're promoting a book, hoping that that sort of like, gets out there as an organic activity that people will, will bring people to it. So totally finding out audiences outside of my own, like we're all kind of in silos sometimes I feel like right. a little bit we're in bubbles. And so how do we get outside of those bubbles with our product? Yeah. And I think it's real easy for people with that bubble. They kind of put those, those like blinders on and they're like, this worked and that's now what I'm going to latch onto. And then they forget that over time, the audience will get drained of that too. And they, yeah. they, they get into this yeah. silo. So you have to like, again, remember to expand that and build upon that. So you're my always most, doing My, my biggest thing is like, how can I, I get so excited when a stranger takes an interest in something? You know what I mean? It's like, yes. when I, that they reach out, it's, like, it's like, you know what? My, my mom will click like on everything that I do. And that's great. You know, but she's already, <laughs> she's already bought the book or a couple yeah. of copies of it. But you know, when, when people I don't know at all just heard about it somewhere and like it, that's like, that's the goal. Absolutely. It, the other thing that, that I noticed that you do is um, for your events, you bring in like gross, gross sounding, but tasty treats. Yes. So what was it? Fleming meringue something or yeah, Fleming so I, bars? I had, a, um, I, had a, um, I had a book event in Atlanta and I partnered up with a sort of, there's a really cool uh, pop-up bookshop and set a coffee shop, which is really cool in, um, in Atlanta called the Bookbird. And so the coffee shop makes their own, they have a bakery and they make their own thing. So I made some gross themed dishes. So they were, they were Fleming bars, so P-H-L-E-G-M-O-N -E bars, which are just green. And I did that at my event yesterday as well. And um, Lice Krispie Treats, which is a Rice Krispie Treats with like uh, chocolate sprinkles in them. And then Poo Nut Butter Cookies. So like <laughs> with peanut butter cookies with a Hershey Kiss that looks like a poo. That's so fine. It's, so it's creating fun by doing that. You you're creating different content that people can also share. That's what that's the hope is. I hope that'll be the next yeah. like you know TikTok recipe. That <laughs> I mean, it's really interesting actually because I'm aiming for a very specific slice of the market, which is kids like elementary school age who are not on TikTok, definitely not mm -hmm. on social media. Like they're shooting for that, um, but mostly they're sort of on YouTube. I would say to the extent they are. So I'm trying to figure out how to sort of get to them kind of through their parents and through parents who know those kids, but it's like, I'm kind of aiming, I'm throwing a ball over a fence at a target, if, right. if that makes sense, as opposed to, and, you know, if I was just making a product for adults, there'd be a lot of places to take it right away. So I have to come up with like fun things that I think will tickle kids' fancies if they kind of get out there. But isn't that really the secret with social media, Julie? There is no secret. It's just trial and error and seeing what hits. There is. Now, but with that, I always tell people, you don't want to treat it, um, I call it the spaghetti method, and you don't want to just throw spaghetti at a wall and hope that it sticks. Um, you still want to kind of have your plan and your strategy, but you have to be willing to shift that plan and strategy if you're finding what's working isn't, or what's what you're doing isn't working, um, or build upon what you discover does work. So like in Rob's case, finding, you know, maybe the, that parent niche group that, you know, the parents are scrolling TikTok and they discover your content and then they're showing it to their kids and going, oh, honey, you're going to love this one. Watch this video. Um, I don't know how many videos I saved for my own son that I'm like, hold on, Jet, you got to come watch this one. Um, so it's kind of that finding that groove, um, but not just being so random about it that you're like throwing the cold spaghetti at the wall. Yeah, so that was like exactly like with this parent activity, I calculated with the calendar this, you know, this coming Sunday is like the last week before school is starting, at least out here. And I thought about I'm a parent, I have two kids. So I'm like, parents are just desperately climbing the walls. Looking for kids, kids don't go back to, to school soon. <laughs> so I completely, like you said, I completely targeted this at parents. I said, parents, do you want a fun, free activity that's not electronics for your kids? And so it was explicitly like trying to appeal to parents and they'll one guy actually wrote in an RSVP and said, 
I'll do anything to get my kids off screens. They're coming to this whether they want to or not. I'm like, that's fine. That works. <laughs> that works for yes. me. The parents are literally, they're over summer. We are all done with it. Yes. We are all like, if these kids do not go back to school, we're going to lose it. Um, exactly. Mine's even older and entertains himself. And I'm like, please get out of my house. Please go. <laughs> Did it? Now, when we were kids, I'm I'm going to refer to us as Generation Xers, and I think Julie you might be a little a little bit younger. I'm X. Okay, so there you go. We didn't start school till September. Right, it's so much earlier. Right, now. it depends. Yeah. So when I lived in California, I didn't start until September, but then I moved um, overseas, and I would start in late late August, almost September. Mm. But we got out later too. We didn't get out till like middle or almost end of June. So I know now my son is out before Memorial day. Um, but he goes back on August 19th, August 16th. So yeah. Yeah. It, it, it just, I mean, I don't have kids, so I have absolutely no barometer. I just remember school was out the middle of June. It didn't start till around September. Mm -hmm. And this just seems really, really early. And I feel like early, we, and yet we, it still feels so far away for a parent. <laughs> I compared it to my wife and I compare it to like, it's like Napoleon, like taking on Russia, except like we, we plan out the summer, like this week isn't covered and this week isn't covered. And what are we going to do for this week? And when you get to the end of it, you're just exhausted. Yeah. I was so excited. I knew that we were on the home stretch of back to school because football started tonight. And I was like, ah, there football you go. practice starts. School is finally on its way. So <laughs> hope is the cavalry's arrived. <laughs> yes. I, I feel like we're on a tangent. So I'm going to rein us back in. Thank you. How's that for transition? Let's talk about content. But it, it, it's the two different sides of it, though. It's what do you create that you're getting out in the world? And also, what do you create to share what it is you've gotten out in the world? Mm -hmm. And so um, you're basically the social is your job, yes. Julie. What do you think, and then, then we're gonna address the what stops people from writing writing in a moment, so stay tuned. What stops people from creating content? Overload. Looking at it and going, where do I begin? I have so much. There is Instagram and Facebook and Facebook groups and LinkedIn and Twitter X, whatever you wanna call it, and now threads. And am I creating YouTube videos? Am I doing TikToks and Reels? And I mean, you think about this list and it only keeps growing. Every time we turn around, there is another new platform and they're like, well, do, but do I have to be there? And what do I have to do? And so it is this overwhelm of going, now I don't know what to do. I don't know how to get started. And should I write a blog or should I do a video or should I just put up an image? So it's, it's this just looking at this giant picture and going, that is a lot. I'm not doing any of it now because now it's just too much. Uh, now, how do we talk people off that ledge? Yes. Now so, that we, we can't just yeah. play with the problem, we have to play with the solution. Right. So I think some of the easy ways to start with that is go, how can I create one piece of content that can become multiple pieces of content? Um, so for instance, what we're doing right here, where this is a live video, that you're going to turn this into a podcast and a blog, and you're going to put an image up on TikTok. So you are creating one piece of content that is an hour's worth of time. And that one hour video, you will then be able to get five or six various pieces of content out of it. You could go even further by taking then that blog. You can share that blog out to all your social channels. You can take quotes from that blog and create tweets with those quotes. You can now use those tweets over on threads if you're over there in that, that new world. Um, you can take snippets from this video and make those into TikToks and Reels, um, YouTube shorts. So you almost could create a month's worth of content or at least a couple weeks worth of content off of one video. So I like to say, start with what you're comfortable with and start with what you know you can easily do. And having a conversation like this, this is easy. You don't even have to treat it as this like, oh my gosh, I'm in front of the camera and it's scary and there's people watching. You literally just treat it like a conversation with some friends and it can become so many pieces of content off of that. 
Um, the other thing is, is using the tools and resources we have, which we now have some amazing tools and resources with the whole new AI world that is out there. And I don't say you don't want to use AI to do the work for you, but you take your piece of work and now you can put it into that AI content and you can put in your blog once it's written and you can say, grab me six quotes from this blog that I can now use as tweets. So now you don't even have to skim the blog to find those. You can literally have it pull them for you. That's going to save you time. There's the AI video tools that will take this one big video and condense that down into smaller clips. Um, so using those tools and resources that are going to save you time. And then just plan out your calendar and go, okay, where do I need to be? Because that's the other thing is you don't need to be on every platform. You need to be where your audience is. So if you're reaching businesses, then you need to be on LinkedIn more than likely. If your audience is an older demographic, you probably want to be on Facebook and Twitter. The, so you look at who your audience is. If your audience is the younger generation or the moms, in, in Rob's case, you might want to make sure you're on Facebook and sure. TikTok. Um, so you're going to start to find out where your audience lives and put your efforts there initially until you have enough content to then expand beyond there. Those were a lot of words, and a, but but a lot of good information. And it, basically you said, okay, Deb, you do this, but you could also be doing this, that, and the other thing. Mm -hmm. And the whole, and my cheat is if you're watching the live stream, you will see that I'm taking the highlights of this and putting it into chat. And that's what, mm -hmm. what becomes my recap. And I know AI can do that for me, but I still like having that little, no, that but little I think bit, right? The other thing is, is you don't want to rely 100% on AI mm -hmm. because AI is not always going to grab what you want it to grab. So by doing what you're doing, you're knowing and ensuring that you're getting the pieces that you want versus relying on something. Um, and I think we have to be careful with AI too, to not become so reliant on it that we're literally just throwing it in, pulling it out and throwing it up wherever we need. And we're not even looking at it. You'll start to see, I'm watching and I'm seeing it happen where you can tell brands that are throwing their stuff into chat GPT and copying and pasting exactly what chat gave them and putting it up as a post and not even looking at it. And there's small little mistakes in there, or there's an overuse of emojis happening. Um, and so you can start to, and emojis are good. They're not bad, but you can start to see and identify the ones who are literally putting it in and pulling it straight out without doing anything to it. So we have to be careful on that balance. So I love that you take those notes. Well, I'm also a freelance writer for like ever, and I also cannot help myself. And then also that that point of the whole AI, and I do have a topic coming up on writing in September, and I have someone who's going to specifically talk about ways that you can use AI in a good way mm -hmm. and how it can work to enhance, not take away from what you're doing. Right. Rob, as a writer, does AI freak you out or do you think of it as good? Um, yeah, I was, uh, I was <laughs> it's interesting you're bringing AI up in the context of what's going on right now. Um, I do think that, you know, this sort of, I don't want to say administrative, but we'll say sort of, uh, um, sort of organizational sort of task you're talking about that it can perform, you know, instead of a person, I think it's really good at terms of those things. And even some of the more like prosaic types of communication we do. Um, I can already imagine my kids doing their thank you notes to relatives using AI because it's such so formulaic. Um, I'm just I'm just a little bit nervous about the whole genie in the bottle thing because I feel like in the context of the, the writer strike, uh, you know, there's a, there's a these companies are clearly trying to, to save a lot of money and use it to do like generative tasks that I think you know, it might be able to do up to some extent one day, but like, it's just about cost savings. And I think, I feel like within certain lanes, it's extremely great and really a great tool for creatives. I'm just nervous that you can't sort of have one without the other because of the, the greed potential for like, you know, getting rid of creatives, which, you know, Deborah, that would affect a lot of the kind of freelance writing you do, 
you know, I imagine the sort of nonfiction, like they're going to try to get AI to be writing those pieces. Uh, so it's an income stream for creatives of all kinds, whether or not it's the main thing they're doing. I think you hit it really the nail on the head. It is a tool. Yes. It is not the whole toolbox. Mm -hmm. right. No. And that, that's where I think the distinction is. If and that's I, your, it, it, I have this because I, I hate smart goals. Okay. I'm not a fan. But people say, okay, Deb, you're a goal strategist. You're into smart goals, right? And I'm like, no, you've got the wrong person. It is a tool. Mm -hmm. It is something you use to get things done. But beyond that, it's not going to think for you. Right. Absolutely. And that's in, in my aspect of like social media content creation. One way that I really like to use it is I will have my, my post. But if I'm posting like a feature release for StreamYard and I'm posting the same post to... Facebook and Instagram and LinkedIn and TikTok and all the places. I don't want it to be word for word across every single platform. Well, I am one human and my brain is only going to rewrite that post so many different ways before I am just like, I am out of words. I have literally <laughs> stared at the same 10 words and I'm trying to rewrite those 10 words in 10 different ways. Um, so I use it to help me enhance changes. So I'm like, you know, rewrite this one for my LinkedIn audience. So I have the initial writing and then I'll have it rewrite it. And then I still go in and go, okay, you're close, but now I need to put our touch on it. So it's still our brand voice. Um, and so I use it again as that tool, but first not draft as, kind of thing, right? Yeah. Sort of it's, tool. I, I could not imagine literally just having it spit something out and copying and pasting what it spit out um, because it's never perfect for me. It, it would be like having an interview transcribed and just copy and pasting those because even though we've come a long way since Dragon Nat, what is it, Dragon Natural speaking, oh my God, one of the early that. ones where you had to like train it to your voice and it still didn't work. So we've no. come a long way, but even now you you can't um, you can't. It's everything is not right. You have right. to review. You have to add your spin. And your personality, because I wonder what would happen. AI, I write an article on this, like Deb. Now I'm curious. I might have to play with that. So, Rob, let's talk about creative or even non creative writing. Um, what stops people from, you know, tapping into all their ideas and turning them into words? Um. I mean, it's interesting because it's, it's it's something that I've overcome, you know, a long time ago. But I think, I mean, first of all, this, you know, the old classic thing is the fear of the blank page, that it's just so overwhelming. I think perfectionism oh. is definitely a thing. Um, when I create things, I have to, some people call it a, um, a closed pin draft. It's like you close your, you cut your nose off because it's you're writing something so horrible. Or some people call it a vomit draft. You have to sort of liberate yourself, I think, to just write bad stuff and kind of get it out there so you can you can revise it and refine it. But a lot of people think like, uh, I have to write things, they have to come out perfectly, it has to be exactly what I want. And that's just, that's just paralyzing. Kind of in the same way that Julie was saying, like the decision of what social media to target, like it's, it's overwhelming. You could write anything, you could do anything. So there's too many choices and you just freeze up. So I think, I think it's that. And I think, um, you know, some people just think they're quote unquote, not creative. You know, which is just in the same way, like, are you, quote, unquote, bad at math? Are you bad at sports or music? All these things are, you know, what parents, you've probably seen this Julie growth mindset versus fixed mm -hmm. mindset. Maybe, you know, yeah. that's a, a thing about, yeah. yeah, am I this way? Or like, is this a thing that I'm not as good at that I could work on? So I think people are still kind of, our society likes to label people certain things. So I think we get stuck in a category and think we're not creative. So do people put themselves in a box or to, do other people open the box and just shove them in? I think both. I think both. Yes, the absolutely. The box is often a prison of one's own mind, but it's one it's constructed by yourself and others, I think. Yeah. I think, you know, it's there's so much um, societal input, parental input, siblings, all of that, that you hear all these things. And even if they're not being said directly at you, there are these things that are happening in the background around you. And then your own voice, your own head, you know, we all get stuck um, in, in our own way. We are our own worst enemies. And we start to tell ourselves, 
I'm too short. I'm not smart enough. I, like you said, I'm not good at math or I'm not good at writing. Um, I'm beyond guilty of doing that for many years and took me a long time to realize that I was doing that and to stop myself. Um, so I think that's something we all tend to face that, uh, what is it? Oh, there was the inner critic. Yeah, that there was a term and I could, it, it went away. Well, there's inner critic and there's analysis paralysis. Well, yes. Yeah. <laughs> and there's probably something else as well. So how do we fix people? You know, <laughs> for the analysis paralysis, it's one I, I do all the time. Um, you know, when I'm, I speak a lot on social media, on live video, on building community. And when I'm writing a new presentation, especially if it's a new talk that I'm going to be giving, I am the worst for analysis paralysis. So what I have started doing is I, again, utilizing this tool as an assistant, I've gone into my AI tool and I'm like, give me 10 titles on building a community with live video. And it'll give me titles and then I can see them. And as soon as I see a bunch of different options in front of me, then I can be like, ooh, I like these ones. Let's pull these over here. And I'm going to write them down or save them in a notepad. And then I can from there start to go, okay, now I saw something because I'm one of those where I'm visual. And so I can't always pull it out until I see it. And as soon as I saw the words from an ex external place, then I was like, now the ideas start going. So then what I do is I just start to outline and I start to go in no order, you know, okay, I know that I'm going to be talking on building a community with video. So we're going to talk about our internal communities, our external communities. We're going to, and I, I just start listing everything that's going to go into that. Um, and once I kind of get it out on paper, then I can see that list and then I can start to put it in order. I can start to expand upon it. I can start to go, nope, that one doesn't need to be on there. Ooh, but I forgot this one that does need to be on there. And, and I start to build it and map it out. Um, but I think it's going to kind of depend on each person's learning style, whether they're that visual, whether that auditory. Um, if you're auditory, record yourself talking about this and listen to it back. Um, you know, if you're, it's just really going to kind of hone in on knowing what your learning style is too. It's a, I love that you said the auditory thing because I was interviewed a couple weeks ago and I was talking about journaling <clears throat> and I got that question. What if you don't write, can you do the audio, do the audio? And then I have it transcribed doesn't need to be perfect. It's for you. Right. Exactly. But to get all those things out of your head and onto the page, then you can play with them. So I am a hundred percent, um, whether you realized it or not, what you said was very depth method -y. you know, determine your mission, explore your options, brainstorm your path to get things out of your head. So you could see right. them. So you yeah. can turn it into something. And, and it's one of those, when you're starting to go through that process, there's not a right answer. There's not a right direction. There is a just throw it all out, whatever comes to your mind in that process. And then, like I said, then that's where you can start to go, okay, oh, nope, those don't belong on there. They have nothing to do with this topic. Um, but you'll, as you start to go through that, you're going to start to find the ones that you forgot as well that did need to be on there. It's so funny because you're talking about the vomit draft, basically. That's yeah. That's a different format. And um, when you mentioned... Uh, journaling, Deborah. Like, I think it was interesting because I, uh, I, I think the whole idea of quote unquote journaling is a little bit like daunting. Because, like, really, I have like eight other, eight other things I want to do. I'm tired. I just want to fall asleep with my book. Really, I'm going to pull my journal out and my, my mole sky. And at the end of the day, I have so many other things I could do. But what I do is I take a sort of journaling approach to attacking a creative problem. By which I mean, I close my devices. I go outside with an no old fashioned notebook and pen. And I write sort of a kind of a free flowing journal entry to myself about what I'm trying to do. Like I'm having a conversation with myself and that, um, that unleashes all the good and the bad ideas like Julie's talking about where I can see them because otherwise they get stuck in this ADHD playground in my head and they never, they never take formation. And the other thing I wanted to mention also is other people is it, is it, is the most powerful tool. Like mm -hmm. I come out of a culture of, of writer's rooms where someone would bring a pitch into a late night show and it's, it's a simple, it's a, you know, reasonably funny idea, but when it bounces around with other people, it takes on a whole emergent property. So if you're trying to crack something, any kind of creative or any kind of uh, problem, like even someone who's not even in your field, like 
someone who's just like-minded, someone that you laugh with, like, yeah. you know, buy him a, buy him a beer and just start having a conversation about it and just say, it's a spitballing with no pressure and no obligation. And you'll be amazed at like how it frees up, it frees up the flow, I think. Yep. I love using my peers and my friends. I will send them my work and be like, I, I need, you know, I'm stuck on this one spot. Can somebody just take an external look at this? And they'll be like, oh, rearrange these two things and add this point here. And I'm like, that was it. That was what was missing. And, you know, it'll be something so simple that just takes that external look. You're too close to it. We get too close to it sometimes. Yes. We need someone else's perspective. So what, and you bring another interesting passage to this. It's the feedback. Mm -hmm. uh, how do you decide what feedback is good and what feedback you need to run screaming from? Rob, you are smiling. <laughs> that is the $64 million question adjusted for inflation. Yes. Uh, I think that, uh, I think in a way, I, I, I sort of think Julie might agree with me. Like, it, it, you know it's right because it hits something that you, you knew, but you couldn't mm -hmm. find it. it. It resonates with something that was in your gut that you were, for whatever reason, you were in touch with. It won't, doesn't come, it doesn't sound like an alien told you to do it. You're like, oh yeah, of course. It has sort of an aha factor. Yeah. And you just know. And if it feels like it's just a stretch or it's cool or funny for some reason that's not really part of your project, it, it should feel like, you know, external to it, if that made any sense. Right. For me, when I get that feedback, I kind of look at it and go, I, like, it'll hit immediately. I will know right. that was exactly what I needed. That was what I needed to hear. Or I'll get something that I'll be like, I like that piece that that works ish, but it's not going to work for me in this moment. It's not the right addition or the right subtraction or whatever it is, whatever kind of content I'm creating that moment. Um, I always like when I'm working with my team that they'll be like, I made edits to this. You're welcome to use these edits if you want, but you don't have to. And that's one of the things we do with our team, um, you know, internally, our marketing team is we'll make edits, but we never say, I made an edit that you have to use. It's, I made these edits, take a look at them and go with them if they're what's going to work for you. We call those not, suggestions, sorry. right? Yeah. <laughs> I think also not relying on ones, you need to have multiple sources of feedback. So like, for example, mm -hmm. when I want notes on a script, like I will get at least three people to do it. Because if you see like the same pattern, two or like two people are flagging the same thing, or at least are not liking the same thing, then you've got something. If it's one person, I think that it's someone I really respect. Right. But you would have to have like a limited number of people because you wouldn't want to send it to 10 people, would you? No, right. Exactly. I think like three or three to five, I would say at the most would be the, I would, that's a lot of people to ask. For, yeah. <laughs> for help, me, honestly. Yeah. I wouldn't go beyond for me. Three is usually kind of my magic number. Um, you know, unless I send it to one and as soon as they send it back, I, they made the suggestion that I'm like, that was absolutely it. Right. I didn't need anyone else's suggestion, um, which has happened quite a few times where I'm just like, I'm stuck on this one, one spot. You know, I, I've, I've, I've frozen, I've got my blinders on and I can no longer see beyond what I'm trying to work on and, um, and I'll get it back. And then I can always tell though, when I get it back from that person, if I didn't get the hit, then I'm like, okay, now we need to keep going. It needs to go to a couple others. And if you keep asking a question and everybody is giving you the same answer you don't agree with, then that is also a sign, mm -hmm. right? Yeah. It's a sign that I, usually what I do in that case is I will actually just step completely away from the project for a little bit. I will let their suggestions kind of simmer. They'll, they'll just sit there and simmer for a little bit and I'll come back to it and open it back up. And either their suggestions immediately then will all kind of fall into place where they should, or I will then step back and go, maybe I need to rethink this whole area here because what they're suggesting still doesn't fit with what I'm wanting to accomplish but there's multiple suggestions so maybe i just need to rethink that whole whole spot i mean one thing one way i look at it also this is this might just be sort of a strictly screenwriter perspective but i try not to get too attached on like this thing is bad because these people said bad i try to look at what is not working here that they're mm -hmm. all like bothered by and they may they may not have articulated it correctly or or helpfully but is it not funny is it not clear is it not moving things forward with energy like if they're all bumped to sort of look beyond what the actual comment is to sort of what the the functional problem is, if that makes sense. Right. I 
<laughs> something I just pulled out to put in the recap. It's not about whether something's good or bad. It's whether or not it's working. Right. Well, and right. in a lot of cases, right, it could be a not yet, which I, I at least for not me. Yet. You know, great. Yeah, I like that. Right. Yes. It's always good to have like that notebook of things that are not yet. These are great ideas that aren't even half baked or quarter baked. They're just like someday ideas. I call, so, I call them too beautiful for this world. Yeah. No, I think the other thing is also making sure that who your audience is, is correctly conveyed when you're getting those reviews. I had a mm. recent um, instance where I was getting some reviews on something that I was working on. It was a presentation. And as I got them back, they were like, well, this is very rudimentary and basic. And I realized that I didn't explain to them that my audience was small business owners that needed that rudimentary and basic lesson in the building your community with live video that I wasn't speaking to other content creators who had been in it for years and were very experienced. I was speaking to people who were just really beginning to get started. Um, and so as they were giving me their feedback, I realized, okay, your, your feedback makes sense if I was speaking to a higher level audience, but that's not who I'm speaking to. I think that's a great point uh, just to hammer on that a little bit is like, I think framing the feedback that you asked for when you asked for it is really important. Like, like I try to proactively like, you know, say it's for this kind of audience, it's for this sort of, we'll say network or buyer or something in this case. And also be as precise as I can for exactly like kind of feedback I'm looking for, you know, I think, as opposed to just, what do you think of this? Just like, might lead to sort of a decision paralysis analysis paralysis on yes. your feedbackers end. Got it. And will you go? I, I'm still stuck on what you were saying a couple minutes ago about the what is this the too beautiful for this world? <laughs> I was just I was sort of joking about the way that I think people get like sort of attached to, you know, they call it killing your darlings, they get sort of attached to something that they love so much, but it's just not at all right for the thing, but it might be good in some other way. But I think Got it's it. also like, I think it's also sort of like you have to have the freedom to, there's not yet. And there's also like probably never going to be or just for me or just for my, myself and my friends. And I think accepting that as opposed to like holding on to things that are just not going to work for people or for the things you need uh, ever and being able to let them go. And also like trust that you're going to come up with new things. Like there's a fear that, oh, I had this great idea. I'll never have another good one. If I, let it, I have to hold on to this one because I'll never have another good one. That's a really pro really common problem for creatives is the fear that you'll never have anything else. And you have to build up the trust that my brain will still keep up, come up with new things. Mm -hmm. I like to use Notion um, for my organization. And I have an idea board. And every time I have a post idea or a video idea, um, a blog idea, it all goes onto this idea board. And some of those ideas get created and posted on social media. And some of those ideas sit on that idea board and may sit there indefinitely. They may never move from that idea board from idea. Um, but I have it marked to where it's an idea, it's an in progress, or it's completed. And some of those ideas probably will stay an idea forever, but they're on there as a maybe. Mm -hmm. Maybes are good. Right. These are sometimes like the building blocks for the best things. Yep. I, I just had this. It, I just had this really bizarre uh, visual of this idea board, and it's like the puppy that never gets chosen is so cute, but it just can't get off that idea board, and then you just feel bad. So you just want. Uh, actually, it, it's it's another tangent. Yay. You could even take that puppy of an idea that's too beautiful for this world and then just play with it, explore to see if it goes on its own adventure. And if not, it can you can corral it back to the board. <laughs> you know, if you know the um, you know the pigeon books by Mo Willem, you must know them, Julie. The pigeon don't let the pigeon drive the bus. I don't. Wow. Well they're 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 picture I books. Those very, ones. They're very popular for like, you know, I think like uh, we'll say like early elementary preschool kids. Okay. Well, well I'm saying, they're this, these great creations. Well, now that you guys don't know the example, it's not such a great one. But anyway, they're <laughs> extremely successful series of books. I think there, there's been uh, TV stuff. Um, they're really delightful. But it just started because uh, this artist uh, would would write would send these these funny cards to friends and family uh, for the holidays. 
with this character and people were like oh i really like that character you should do something with that but it came from this pure place of i'm not i'm not going to try to like take this thing and market it in some way like i'm just going to have fun with a creative idea and then sometimes those uh can themselves when you're not trying maybe when you like you sort of turned off that part of your brain sometimes real, the real gold can come out of those things sometimes ideas are just fun yes. and i always have um some sort of creative project that doesn't get nearly as much attention but it's there for when i feel like you know putting some time and energy into it and i think it's always fun to have those those side pro especially and even when your job is writing do you yeah. have other fun creative things you're working on we have this very american idea that everything has to be like for profit and for productivity and i think we should like liberate ourselves from that and just allow ourselves to play oh i'm so with you yeah absolutely because play is like if we're not having fun what is the point what are we doing yeah right I think the other thing is, is when everything becomes a job, it's exactly that. It's a job. Right. And then you view it, you're going, okay, well now I have to have a strategy behind it. And now I have to have a plan and now I have to have a process. And you're like, sometimes you just have to let that go. You know, if, if you enjoy taking pictures for work and it's part, you know, Instagram for is part of your job. Remember that you can also just go have a fun Instagram account that is nature, if nature is what speaks to you or your family. Um, so remembering to kind of take what is work, but also have fun with it. Well, and the other thing is, if you love what you do, which I think all three of us do, at least most of the time, right? <laughs> when you love what you do, it's awesome. But it doesn't mean you can't keep finding things that remind you of why you love mm -hmm. what it is that you do. Creative adventures. Okay. Agreed. We're smiling. Yeah. We're nodding. Why Not great for the podcast, <laughs> but it, you froze there for a split second. I was like, I don't know where she went with that. Oh, did I freeze? It On my end, it did at least. So. Okay. I thought you were just agreeing with me and you were just like, Wow. Well, I agree with you. <laughs> yeah, this is, it's such a fun conversation. And the reason, part of why I love doing this show, it's to bring people together who their paths might not cross otherwise to have a conversation. And basically you're from two different parts of my life yeah, and you're basically agreeing with each other, which is, you know, it's fun, but that's what this, that's what this fun project is for is, it's motivation, inspiration. If you're holding yourself back from trying fun, creative things, we're here to tell you stop. Yeah. And on that note, let's let's give some goals. So let's get some people out of their heads. What is something that they could do today, tonight, tomorrow to get out of their brain and start creating more content, whether it's for social, creative, or both? Well, I think. I'm going to go the social route because that's my, my niche and my, my world is start to figure out what you want to be creating for your audience, who your audience is. Like that's the easiest one is who are you talking to? Are you talking to your personal audience? Are you talking to your business audience? So kind of define what those are and where they live. And when you define it, those who they are and where they live, then start to figure out how you can plan out the content that you want to create without getting overwhelmed by going, how can I take pieces of content and get multiple uses out of it? Um, whether it's starting with a video and going the route that like Deb does with the blog and the podcast and all of that, starting with a blog, you can start with a blog and then record your blog as a podcast and do short like snippets on social about it. So kind of figuring that out and, but starting with bigger pieces of content that can be brought down into the smaller little pieces and used all over the place. Because I think that is really the easiest way to not go, oh my God, I have to write 50 social posts, you know, to cover the next month on all my channels. And how am I going to do that? Um, because that's a lot. And it's a big number. So start with one piece and get all your little pieces out of it. Wow. That was like 
27 goals in one, <laughs> which I am okay with. Define your audience. Who are they? Where do they live? So yeah. that uh, that's, that's really other you, platform. You have to start there. That's number right. one. And then figure out what kind of content you want to create for them. Start with one big piece and turn them into little pieces. Yeah. So it's not 27 goals. It's five. But they're five very manageable goals right. because it is a plan. And let's add to have fun with it because your audience will know. Yes. Right. Absolutely. You have to have fun. Um, you know, one of the things I love about what I get to do at StreamYard is we get to get to be very creative and, and try new things and have fun things. So for instance, today on Instagram, our post was our mascot puddles upside down and our coffee cup asking how many cups of coffee is it going to take you to get through Monday? So have fun with your content that you're creating because otherwise the audience is going to see right through it. And if you're not having fun, they're not going to have fun and they're not going to stick around. And just so you know, Puddles is stuffed. No real animals were injured during the creation <laughs> yes. of this show. Yes. He, he is uh, he's a little plush, plush mascot. Yes, adorable. That, that's fantastic. Rob. Well, what I goal? don't know. I would say that I'm not exactly disagreeing with Julie. I would just say that I'm looking at a different part of the process. Yeah. Um, that's what we want. But she, you have a very uh, sort of like strategic getting it out to a public, like, I'm not going to lie. when you say just calling it content just bothers me a little bit, sort of at the very like origins of creativity, because you're thinking already of a vessel and a product and an audience. And I think those things can be sort of the sort of paralysis we're talking about. It might be getting in your way. And I definitely, it's all those tips are really awesome. And those are things I need to do a lot better. Um, what I would say is just a simple goal is you've got something burning in your brain kick that your goal today is just kick that further down the road and just let just just let yourself in whatever form that takes naturally like for me it's the notebook having a conversation with someone speaking into your thing go take a walk and just just spitball about it and i think that at least in my experience you'll sort of you know it it is what it wants to be you'll find out what it wants to be you know is it something that's going to be like a series of videos or blogs or, or something like that. Is it going to be for a certain audience? It's going to find what it wants to be if you just let it out of its cage. So just just take that creativity and just like let your take the bushel away and let your light out, and and don't necessarily rush that. And you really you'll start to get a really start sense of it, and then you'll figure out all the stuff Julie's talking about. I think so. Yeah. Um, that's and that's going to what you said about the fun part. Like I would say, stay in the fun part as long as you need to, and then. Hopefully that, that fun will make it always genuine and organic to what you're doing. And it won't be something you have to think of. And then you'll think about who, who would like this the most and how you share it with them. So in a way, we're, 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 these are really kind of complimentary. Yeah. Because even with the strategic points that Julie's making, you could still have fun with it. What what do I want to create? What is that thing that's kind of sticking in my head? So it can be for a content creating for social project, or it could be for like a bigger picture project, whether it's a book series or videos or what have you. And I think that the best thing that you can gift yourself if you've got these ideas is that time to see what it wants to be because if you gift yourself the time your project will thank you by turning into something so i have to share real quick this amazing um thing i just discovered like oh probably six months ago or so we always hear people talk about when you're in the shower you get like your best ideas but as soon as you get out of the shower then you're moving on with your day and you're getting jumping into everything and unless you jump out of the shower and have like a notepad right there to write things on you, they're long gone that you've done forgotten about them by the time you get out. They make these shower notepads uh. and I literally have in my shower now that are these waterproof notepads that you can write. So like as you're in there and all these like fun ideas come to you while you're in the shower, uh, you can jot your notes down and then stick them on your desk and kind of circle back to them. I, I think I just like somebody had posted about, I don't know, TikTok or one of those things that you're like, Oh, and uh, and so I went on to Amazon and had Googled shower notepads and found all kinds of different options. 
That's I awesome. I love I, that. I would go further and say you should have a little notepad that you have at any time because you just don't ever know when something will come to you. Yes. And uh, you want to be open to, you know, have an open ear to that. Whatever, even at the worst possible time, even if you're in a meeting or something like that, make a little, you know, I'm a fan of like making shorthand notes of things just so I can sort of return to them if I'm really too busy to, to dwell on them. That's great. So it, it's something might be even, even smaller than a not yet, but to be able to capture oh, yeah, yeah. any idea. Yeah. Right. And if it's really something that you, uh, that really is something that's, that's from within you and is really interesting and new, then it's not going to go away. You just might need a reminder or just a prompt to get back to it. Yeah. And I use the notepad on my phone a lot for that because I pretty much always yeah, have that by me. Right. But the shower was the one place that I would like, and then the ideas right. would be gone because I could, even if I could grab the phone, it's waterproof, but you can't type on it very well when your hands are wet. And so that was why I was like, okay, I have to get this one piece because I can't get these notes down while I'm in there. Do you, Rob, have a favorite a uh, toy like tool or is it just like the actual notepad is like the best toy the no i use the notes on my phone too because it's usually what's at hand and um so and uh you know whatever is easiest for you really i think is mm -hmm. the whatever is quickest and easiest like don't overthink it exactly i think that that's or probably the, the, don't... the voice memo that whatever that if that works for you just make a note to yourself on a voice if you're driving for example that's like you might a lot of people have good ideas when they're driving so use your voice memo or you know Siri, or if you need Siri voice to text yourself, that sort of thing. I I like to say Alexa, remind me this, and then it comes up as a reminder yeah. Yeah. on my phone, and then it can get moved somewhere else. Exactly. Well, what a fun conversation about creating content, whether it's fiction, nonfiction, social, creative, not so creative, kernels of ideas, big blown, it's the gamut. But I think we've decided, you know, that starts with gifting yourself the time to develop the ideas and see where they go. And also, I want to add, give yourself, gift yourself the permission to do it. Yes. Like, yeah. don't feel like I'm not in that lane. That's not me. Like, if it's coming to you, then let yourself explore it, even if, you know, not at the expense of your family and your job, but, you know, <laughs> uh, but let yourself explore it because you, why not you? Why not you? I love that. So important. And yeah, I, I'm just, I am nodding. Okay, podcast people, I am nodding because it is the time, but also the permission and stay out of the box that people try and put you in because that's another big thing. I feel like we, as many of a list of do's there are, there are that many or more don'ts. So yeah. stop yeah. don'ting and just keep doing. Yeah. I love that one too. I kind of going back on the idea board I have, one of the things I have with my team is I tell my team, if you see anything or you think of anything that might work on our social, put it on this list for me. Because again, one, I'm only one human and I'm only going to have so many of my own ideas that I love working with that team aspect where I can tell them there is no wrong idea. I may not use it, it may not work for us at that time. It may go on my idea board and sit there indefinitely, but then I can get and build those and go, there is no wrong idea. Love it so much. Friends, please tell people where they can learn more about you, Rob. Um, shockingly, my website, uh, well, you already put it up there, robcutner.com. That's K-U-T-N-E-R. Um, and I also tweet sometimes at, at Apocalypse How. Um, that's where I promote things mostly. Uh, and, you know, as I said, I feel like the other places are not quite as big yet, but I am on Threads. I'm on Blue Sky under my name as well. Awesome. And Julie, where can people learn more about you? Yeah, so I'm all over all of StreamYard's channels, of course, but personally, I am at Social Jewels, J-E-W-E-L-S-I-C-T. So, and that is my handle on all the social channels. Awesome. And I am at the Dev Method everywhere. And you could go to the devmethod.com slash blog to get the recap, the links, and the highlights from this and all the previous episodes. Um, what a fun conversation about creating content. And it's it's there. You have your ideas, you have your thoughts, so you might as well put them out there. And it starts with choosing yourself 
at having patience, staying out of the box and giving yourself the permission to explore. Yeah, I think I, I pretty much encapsulated everything. Uh, <laughs> You just saved us an hour. You just saved us an hour of talking. Five seconds, Deb. Excellent. Uh, this has been a really, really fun conversation. Like I said, it's fun for me because you know, two people from from writing life and social media life bringing you both together. I thought it was really, really cool to have that fun little exploration of both sides of the writing coin. So thank you so much, Rob Cutner and Julie Riley, and thank you for tuning in and choosing to prioritize more of your content. I am live every 4 p.m. every Monday at 4 p.m. Pacific on Facebook, LinkedIn, and YouTube. And again, go to the devmethod.com slash blog um, to get the recaps and or learn more about me and my old cheerleading <laughs> for goals. Uh, before we wrap, I what one final thought do you want to leave everybody with? Julie? Ooh. Um you know, I was going to ask you, you shouldn't really be surprised. <laughs> I know. I knew, I knew it was coming, but I kind of forgot it was coming. Um, the, you know, the final thought I think really is you have to get started. That's the one thing, whether it's just jotting down the random ideas, whether it's starting the strategy and the planning, whatever it is that you need to get started, you have to get started because if you sit there and just stare at the piece of paper or you sit there and just stare at the camera, it, it's never going to create um, you're never going to get the content. So start, put it down, get it out of your head, record it, record your voice, write it down, whatever it is you need to use, get started. Awesome. And Rob, final thought? I totally agree, I totally agree with that. And I would also add, uh, look at the long game. Think about it as the long game. Like there's this pressure, like I have to like achieve content and market penetration tomorrow with this new idea as opposed to I'm starting the process, you know, a version of what Julie said, but it's going to be a process and there's a lot of steps to it. So take the first one and don't get too burdened. Yeah. I, I'm going to add one more in there. So get started, look at the long road, but celebrate all of those victories along the way because that will make that Absolutely. long journey yes. feel a lot shorter. 100%. Uh, Thank you again, Rob Cutner, Julie Riley, for joining me. Thank you for either watching or tuning into um, Goals Chat Live, aka the Dev Show Podcast. Thank you for choosing yourself, your goals for creating content. Go on out there and go for it because we know you can do it. <laughs>